we're live. Good morning. Welcome to the first webinar of our series, Conversations with Your Friendly Neighborhood Black Guys. I'm Keenan Mose. I'm Kiyoshi Taylor, and welcome. Today we have a very exciting guest, or multiple guests for you guys today. Uh, we have the original revolutionary artist and minister of culture for the original Black Panther Party, Emery Douglas. So give it up for him, virtually, I guess. And we also have Keone Health Care Manager, active with the uh, All African People's Revolutionary Party. And a Los Altos High 2003 graduate and former BSU president. So the house today. Yeah, we've been working really hard over these past few months. So right before we get into letting Emery teach us about all this amazing stuff that he's done and how he's used art, we just kind of like to talk to you guys about the new vision for Justice Vanguard. Kiyoshi and I went to high school together and kind of met back up in June through the marches that we've been doing. And we, along with Seth, created Justice Vanguard as a way for us to kind of organize our communities around education, creating change, and spreading awareness. A lot of people have done a lot to help us, support us, and learn as well. So we appreciate that. And we're very excited for what we have in store for you tonight. So Kyoshi, you want to talk about this uh, new JV logo and vision? Yes, I do. I mean, first of all, like you just mentioned, uh, we wouldn't be here without, for, uh, without everybody in the community, without the teachers in the MVLA district. So thank you guys so much. None of this would be possible without you guys and your continued support. Uh, JV, uh, as started from where we are you know we got a two local legends here and we're going in a brand new direction uh we will be we have a new logo new website uh and plenty of interesting and uh, just exciting things we can't wait to bring you guys uh including education uh conversations with your friendly neighborhood black guys and a lot more including donations to keep this going so keenan Give, give the people a little bit of uh, information on that. Yeah, so we just came out with our new website. You can check that out, justicevanguard.org. On there, we break down how we're working on educating our communities, organizations, and businesses. We work on having small projects of like how we can make immediate change. And you can see that on a donations page as well as kind of our long-term um, fundraising that we've done. There's a lot of different ways for you to get involved and help out whether it's through monetary and donations, which is the lifeblood of keeping these things going, or if it's through volunteering your time. And we just added a contact part on there. You can go ahead and reach out. Let us know in that little like section like what it is you do and how you'd like to help out, and let's get things going. This is only the beginning. Now, without any uh, further distractions from us, let's hand it off to Emery Douglas right here. Take it away. You're, you're muted. Good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm delighted to be here with the young folks uh, to present this evening. And I'm going to give, going to do a, a, a PowerPoint presentation of some of the more recent work I've done uh, uh, since the uh, Black Panther Party. And I will start off with uh, this one here because this, uh, it was, this were the founders and co-founders of the Black Panther Party. Uh, this was Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. It was started October 15, 1966 in Oakland, California. And uh, mind you, the name changed from the Black Panther Party for self-defense, which was the original name, to Black, shortened to the Black Panther Party in 1968. Uh, that, that was thereafter when the, uh, the defense aspect of the program begin to expand into the other issues, social programs that we had, and also dealing with the, uh, the, the Free Huey movement when Huey was incarcerated in prison in, in 1968. And so this is why I'm going to start with this. If time permits, uh, I will um, go back to some of the retrospective images that I've done in the past, but I'm going to show you more remixes and, and uh, stuff I've done since then. Here's the more original recent uh, uh, one I've done of the uh, remix of the uh, Panther, uh, Simple Itself. 
the original Panther symbol came from the South during the uh, Civil Rights Movement in, 19, in 1965 when the Voters' Rights Act was passed. In Lowndes County, Alabama, you had uh, you had students from Nonviolent Court and Community SNCC and uh, Stokely Farm Market SNCC and others who went to Lowndes County, a uh, predominantly black county of uh, 20,000. Um, and but they were controlled by the, the racist political machine there, which was pretty the Democratic Party. And they were, they were black plantation owners in that sense, in that context. But the people of Lyons County wanted to vote, but they didn't want to vote and be a part of the Democratic Party, nor the Republican Party as their symbol. So they had to sign, uh, the way it goes, they had to have a icon in order to be an official organization. So they seen these high school sports teams and they had the animals, you know, like sports team. And so they chose the Panther. So the symbol comes from the South during the civil rights movement. This is one of uh, or recent one I call uh, Malcolm X the Warrior. This is uh, Malcolm X, uh, and this one here is in my book, Black Pants of the Revolutionary Army of Pyramid Douglas, which is not published right now, it's out of published. I plan to publish it again. And this one here to my right is Dr. King. I also like to highlight uh, people who were common folks, community folks who used to come around, they used to buy the paper, uh, and they would, this brother would be slush, but he would come get his paper every week, no matter what, he would come get his paper. But I want you to make the checks as you may be able to see not well here, more, more in, in relevant to what's going on today, you know, with global warming and those issues, unemployment, all those things are relevant in the context of the text that I've applied to this particular paper. This sister would, would come, and lived in the back of our central headquarters at that time. And she would buy her paper and sit out in the back and read it every, every week. Every, every week she'd sit out there, when her paper comes, she'd write, sit out there and read it. And as you can see, the headline on it says, SOS Global Warming. And the back page says, Respect Mother Earth. Don't support the greedy. Here's a remix of a historical one I've done. And this one here said, here we are living in the land of the plentiful, while we the people starve. And he is here, the People's Free Food Program, the collage on, of the actual photograph from our historical free food giveaways. And, you know, we get five, 10,000 bags of grocery away at a time. Uh, the other chapter, we have 49 chapters and branches of the organization itself, Black Panther Party. There were some who may not have only give away 100, 200 bags or whatever. But we were able to hear as off and on from time to give away thousands of bags of groceries uh, at a time. Here again, showing sharecroppers, these are, plant, these are sisters and brothers uh, reminding that we work the same field that the uh, sharecroppers work today in the valleys and up and down the coast during that particular time. I recall as a kid, uh, they used to have the buses would come into the, new, into the community to pick black folks up to go to the field so that they can make uh, a little money to pay the rent or, or to buy clothes or groceries or what have you during the summer and, uh, uh, and on the weekends during, during the, uh, during the uh, when it was the uh, not summer months when school was in or what have you. This is the educate to liberate and it kind of integrated some of the, uh, the collage African uh, uh, material into the uh, artwork as well as a pattern or clothes. This one says uh, Turtle Island, North America, indigenous territory. This, all this, is North America is Turtle Island. That's indigenous name, yeah. This one says health is wealth. I like this saying, yeah, it's non toxic. This is also one plan with, with the buttons that says, I'm food insecure. This one says, I'm homeless. So it's trying to give a sense of what the reality is today in the context of those who may not look like they're food insecure, those who may sometimes may not look like they're homeless. That is the reality that exists at this today. Here's one also off of a remix of a historical one where it's called Survival Pending Revolution. 
which is the reality which is, exists today. It says free breakfast for scoop served here, for children served here, Mondays through Fridays, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., which we used to get up early in the morning with the community, two or three o'clock in the morning and fix breakfast for the kids when they went to school. Uh, you had cultural centers, you had families that opened up their houses, you had churches, you had all those who were receptive to uh, open, opening up their, uh, their venues and places for us to have the breakfast program. We had the free food giveaways, as I, you've seen the free, food, free uh, breakfast bags I showed you earlier. We had the free health, people's free health clinics across the country. Uh, we had the George Jackson's people's free health clinic out here. George Jackson being a brother who was who, who, who well known. Uh, you can historically check out a lot of stuff on him. Uh, he was uh, uh, in San Quentin. He started the, uh, wanted to start the first chapter of Black Panther Party inside prison. So in San Quentin, that became our first official branch of the Black Panther Party was in San Quentin prison. Jack, George Jackson was assassinated by the state, claiming that he was trying to make an escape, which was not the reality, reality at that time. Here we got the uh, People's Free Food uh, Clothing Programs. We had a People's Free Shoe Giveaway, all those. We had a free ambulance service in Winston-Salem, which is our first chapter in the South. Because the ambulance would not come into the neighborhood, the Panthers went and got certified and the community helped them buy an ambulance. And so we had a, a, a free ambulance service in Winston-Salem, uh, North Carolina. We also had a free bus in prison program or we take those who were had loved ones who were incarcerated to visit. And Chicago, they just happened to have, at that time, they had a bus, like a ground bus, that was given to them. And so what they did is they put took the all the writing off and put the free bus, free uh, busing program on it and put the Black Panther Party icon on it. And that bus was used along with other transportation and volunteers who had transportation who would announce where we were going to be, people could be picked up at this location. And then if you had loved ones, you could get a free wide ride to the prison and back. Uh, and that was a weekly program that we had across the country. This is called Father's Love. This is called Mother's Love. This is about reparations. As you can see, this was an image I did just with, uh, uh, with uh, it was an uh, uh, exhibition that dealt with Japanese American and African American reparations. It, this was done uh, at the Eastside Arts Alliance in Oakland, California, uh, several some years back. Here again is you using figures to spell out the word reparation with chains connected to them and uses this Adinkra symbol, which is usually the West, West African symbol. And it's, it's about justice, but, and it, it, it represents in general, you are a slave from him whose handcuffs you wear. Here you're dealing with the, the past president. He, uh, he was a, a, a liar, no matter where he looked, no matter where he turned. He just spouted lies, lies. He was a fascist xenophobe. Immigration, talking about it was about white only, that's what that was about. Institutional racism. Also in, in, the, in, in relationship to that here you had, where you got families separated from their kids, sending the family, sending the elders back and the babies incarcerated and, and, and separated from the families. So it's ice cold wickedness, playoff ice. Ice cold wickedness made in America. Mommy, mama, papa, poppy. Here's one dealing with uh, justice, resist unjust laws. Amendment one to the Constitution of the United States of America. Freedom of religion, speech, and the press. Rights of assembly and petition. BDS down with apartheid. Boycott, divest, sanction. It, freedom of speech, First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America. Here's one showing solidarity. BDS, BDS, 
Hashtag BDS down with apartheid. Peace heals, war kills. Here's the two uh, I did, uh, did. This is one with Spike Lee, uh, and this is one uh, for the Judas and the Black Messiah. I was asked by Kenny Gavelson, the director, a brother who's the designer for, uh, for Spike Lee's film, who had asked me to work on the, uh, uh, Spike had liked the uh, image I did in 1969, similar to this. And he wanted to reflect that in this image. And Spike called me and I didn't know who it was. I didn't think it was a real Spike Lee. So I didn't respond. He, he, he emailed, called me back an email and, went, and said, this is the real Spike Lee. And so uh, I called him and he said he, what he wanted me to do to work on this poster, uh, one of the PR posters for the film and to get with Kenny Gavelson, which I collaborated with the art director to put this one together. Then it was Ryan Coogler who also asked uh, uh, Kenny if I would be interested in doing, working on this particular one that reflected the, uh, the brother who was the lead actor and, and the symbol of just like the poster I did for Fred Hampton. So this was a collaboration uh, to do both of these that way. Here you got, I'm spelling the word war in an abstract way and you had to hold bullets, but this is like a, abstract symbol of a Bantu symbol, African, Af South African Bantu symbol. And that means, uh, uh, that stands for war, when they got the points coming at each other. If they were going the same direction, it would mean peace. So this is what would play off of that uh, in the context of uh, uh, this art image itself. Here again is one is dealing with the, what's the war, and what war does to human beings, the byproduct of war, uh, man, landmines all over. Now, today, where you got all these terrorists and wars going on, you got landmines, landmines, landmines. You got hundreds of thousands of people who lost limbs, life, and what have you, Africa, Asia, Latin America, from landmines that have been there and have been removed. Talking about Mother Earth and global warming. Here you have the scene where global warming is happening. And this is a playoff of the, uh, the doomsday clock, where we're supposed to be so close to the countdown of where no of no return in the context of global warming, which is becoming more and more of a reality every minute, every second. Here is showing global warming. This one also, global warming, Mother Earth. I also did this one remix quickly to have it with the mask and COVID, what we're dealing with today. Respect Mother Earth. Here's one I had did for the uh, deal in, uh, on Haiti. And you know, also the Haiti Defense Committee used this one at one time on the, on the, uh, the publication. But this is when the uh, this was about when the uh, the UN soldiers feast uh, urinated and defecated in the, in the water that caused the uh, cholera epidemic in Haiti. You had over eight to ten thousand Haitians who died or more from cholera epidemic. Thousands and thousands of them became sick. The UN was reluctant to acknowledge that they were the ones accountable or responsible for it. And I, I don't think to this day there has been any, any rep, uh, restitution for them to the Haitian people because of that. I think they just briefly maybe announced that they acknowledged that they were the ones the cause of it. Black Lives Matter, Justice Now, Black Lives Matter, as much as things change, some things stay the same. Why do they get to brutalize and murder us and we get to blame? Police terror, USA. And this is dealing with all the symbols of all genders. This was the recent first one I did, but it had the BART badge on it because it was about the young brother who was murdered in BART in Oakland. 
Here is the collaboration I did with Aboriginal artist Richard Bell in Australia, in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, they wanted to highlight uh, Peter Norman, who was the white guy who ran second in that race in, 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 in uh, 1968 Olympics. He was in support and solidarity with John Carlos and Tommy Smith. He wore, they, he wore the badge, I think, Olympians for Human Rights, that said something like that. And what happened, he also qualified for the 1972 Olympics with the best time still in Australia. But they blacklisted him. He was never allowed to run again because he supported John Carlos and Thomas Smith in 1968 at the 1968 Olympics. The Australia, New Zealand, and apartheid South Africa was called the apartheid triangle back then. This is an incident that took place before the 1968 Olympics when you had the students and activists who were slaughtered uh, in, uh, uh, during the Olympics. You had some Olympians from uh, Italy, I believe, who just refused to participate in the Olympics in 1968 because of that. And it was called a Tila Teleco Massacre. I, I, quite, I, quite, I hate to say it, but I, I'm not able to pronounce the name well. But this was where they, the location where they thought they were going, where there would be some kind of agreement and they would work out some kind of a notion, negotiation. And when the odd masses of the people came there, they were in these buildings on, across the corridor and they just slaughtered them. They just slaughtered them. They're taking them out in truck, truckloads, all the activists. And the US was involved with that. The Pentagon sent radios, sent weapons, ammunition, and riot control training material to Mexico before and during the massacre. This was in 1968, during the three weeks before the Olympics were to, were to actually start. And I tried to reference it with using kind of military equipment that he was sending at during that time and bullets and what have you. This is me in the uh, in a store in Chiapas, Mexico, where I went to I collab or went to, uh, to collaborate with the Zapatistas uh, with the Chiapas with the Idello Art Center. Caleb Duarte wanted me to come to do some work in, with uh, with the uh, Zapatistas uh, 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 painting the Zapatista store. And this was the store when he was taking me in to introduce me to the store st folks in the, in, and we were gonna come back next year uh, to paint the store. It was a collective of us, about 13, 14, 15 of us. And this is when we came back and we, this is us when we painted the store. They wanted it to be about solidarity, culture, education, health. Those are the theme of the, of the store itself. These were my my several contributions to the uh, dis, uh, ex on the store, and people say they, who go to that way, going to Palenque and other places that they usually see this, they still see the store and the uh, still uh, everything is still rich and look fresh. These are uh, as I showed the men, they're about people of the corn, and they kind of humorous about things. They they move as like a sales pace. They take their time. We we'll have you. So it's about salute, solidarity, education, production, culture, people of the corn. These were the Zapatista dials that you see up here. Oh, that's a part of the installation. These are embroideries that were reinterpreted of my work. Five, there were six of them, but this is five of them. These are done 20 by 30 inches, and they're uh, uh, their uh, embroideries done by Zapatista Mayan Women Collective. It was two collectives, one that did the uh, manual uh, uh, embroidering, the other one done, and some was, had to be done by, mach by machines. And it was a, played off of Zapatista, Zapantera Negra, means Zapatista Panthers, that's what it's played off. And there was, there was a whole thing out around this. It was music called Zapantera music, and we did all kinds of presentations, they had musicians, had performances, all these things, that been showing solidarity, solidarity. 
Here is uh, in um, Urbis in Manchester, England. This is in the UK. When I, I first had my first exhibition uh, out, outside the country. And this is about two hour train ride outside of uh, London. And this is, uh, they had desks that were books connected that were required reading for, in the Black Panther Party that people could come and sit and read what we were required to read. You had the video and audio that people could listen to, snippets about the Black Panther Party. And you had throughout, you had all these ex exhibition space filled with the uh, artwork, sometimes overlapping and what have you. And it was an um, amazing exhibit. It, it was, um, went on in October, I think 2000, 2008. And it went on until April, 2009. They say they had over 43,000 people who attended the exhibition there. This is opening night of that exhibition. This is in uh, New Zealand, Auckland, New Zealand. When I was invited to, uh, when I was invited there to for artists in residency for 40, 41 days at Elam International School of Fine Arts. And on the streets you have up by the university, they had plaster these signs. I think these are real tall because I come about right here when you when you walking down the street, and um, they had. But what happened? There was so much interest in my coming in the Panthers that they we couldn't do the artist in residency, so we traveled the North and the South Island of New Zealand, talking about the history of the Black Panther Party and the artwork in, in that context. Myself along with others. A lot of people don't know that there were. The, new, the, the Polynesian Panthers, who were original chapter in New Zealand, in 19, came in 1971. This is when I visited our boys school. This is in, uh, in, in New Zealand. Amazing artists, all this are art school. And these are all Samoans here who went to that school. Maori is the primary uh, uh, iwi tribe in New Zealand, is the Maori who are Pacific Islanders. And these are Pacific Islands as well, but just Samoan. And, and I went to their class and enjoyed the whole experience. This is in uh, Argentina when I was invited to try marching. Try marching is a thing that these young people put together where they had begin to bring in artists to talk with them because they felt they didn't have any qualified artists to teach them there. And they have it at this major basketball stadium. It's, on, it's in Mar del Plata, it's on the coast. And they have, and they want me to come because they want to begin to add more politics into the, the, the program itself. And they have major big teeth, like you go to the movies, that's what these are, big screens on the side, like the huge movie screens. And a, a, a professional uh, interpreter, because I don't speak English, but you had, People from there, from Brazil, Bogota, Colombia, every year, young people, just five, 6,000 strong young people who come to these tri marches. Before you give the presentations, they have outside in the corner of the basketball uh, stadium, young artists with all their exhibits. You go outside the stadium, the grass, they had skateboarding, they had music playing, then they, put the call in, do you come in and you do your presentation? And you get about an hour to do your presentation. And there was a, 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 a great response to the presentation after I did my pre presentation. And I was trying to figure out what was it that they, what, what was about it that they were so connected to, inspired by, and spirit with. And I've, I've come to the conclusion that they could, were inspired by the work itself because they could feel the connection between the resistance and stuff that they're dealing with in their country reflected in the artwork. And so the, that was the commonality. This is in Portugal. I was invited, been to Portugal several times, about three times to Portugal. And this is where I exhibit in Portugal. And each step, each time you go up to uh, each level, they had uh, an image of mine up on the wall as you go in. 
And as you go through some of the app rooms, you see the images painted on the walls. It's here as well. Not the same image, but this is at Nottingham Contemporary in Nottingham in, 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 in the UK. This is in uh, Bank of the Republica. This is in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, you have some, and this is in, standing in front of the announcement for the exhibition. I was invited there by these uh, designers who had did some design and work for the Bank of the Republica. And what happened is that they had, they told them, they say they want to, they want, they say they could have do requests to do something there. They, it, and they sent in their proposal because they knew of my work and they wanted me to come. And they were surprised when they agreed and said yes. And so this is how the whole, whole thing came about in Bogota, Colombia. This is kind of like on some of the streets around that area where you had the signs on the display and about announcement about it. It was overwhelmingly packed. It was so packed they had to have it over to another room. As you go up and down the streets, you would see the uh, announcements and what have you. This is in Brazil. This is at a place called Sesame in Brazil. And this is outside. This is one of them huge New York block kind of uh, cultural centers. Four, four stories. And this is the outside of it. As you go in, they had elevators, four or five, all the elevators, about 10 elevators with different, where they put the artwork on the elevators itself. And this is inside getting preparations for the exhibition. Here is opening night. It was tons and tons of people came through there. You had a lot of young brothers and sisters who live in, the, in, in all in those all of the burials where they gang banging and what have you all kind of came through and invite me to, to come next time. They wanted me to come and see where they stayed at. And they were they 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 they, they loved it because it's uh, art that reflected them, which you normally didn't see a lot of that in Brazil in in some way in some way in this context. This is in Oakland, California. This is the one up on 26th Street between Broadway and uh, I think Telegraph, the little narrow street there. And this is about the uh, uh, Palestine, Artists in Solidarity for Palestine. And it's across, the, it's uh, right on the back of that Honda building, big Honda building in, that, in the street. And this is, uh, you had about nine different artists. You had a Jewish American artist. You had an Afro, Afro, uh, Afrocentric artist. You had a Japanese American artist, Arab American artist, myself. You had indigenous artists. You had artists from Jordan who was able to come in, and the and the uh, Jewish American artists did the work of the uh, Palestinian women who could not what they would not she could not leave Palestine, so she did her work for her on the wall. And we had many helpers. We had people who mixed the paint, who helped us paint it. So it wasn't just us by ourselves. This was a collective of a lot of folks uh, working together. I was able to come in about uh, a couple of weeks into it because I had to go to I had to go to Canada to on, 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 in relationship to the Zapatero project. So I came back in uh, about the last three weeks of the project itself, and this was my my contribution. Say free to land. This is here me standing with the young Palestinians afterwards in front of the mirror. And they want to link it to the indigenous, the original caretakers of the land. So these are uh, in, 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 uh, 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 indigenous uh, symbols and decorative at the bottom, all the way across. This is Arusha, Tanzania. It's where I went to, to and this image, Sister Charlotte, who's the Panther, has a, has a, and her husband have a collective there for many, many years. And they serve that community in Arusha, Tanzania. And they want you to make, they want just to be a part of that here. These youngsters are different from different tribes. Some of them are my side. I think some of the other names I don't know, but they're coming together, transcending tribalism and unity, working together, talking about solidarity and getting away from the tribalism and stuff that they have going there. Endangered species. This is well, I mean, young, I'm getting pretty close to closing out. This is some of these youngsters here who are endangered species, less 1% or so. 
who don't realize that what else is happening with the collateral damage that they're creating as well, the suffering, the pain, I call it mental bondage, talking bullets, pointing bullets. This same image was I done with a youth group in New Zealand when I was invited there because they do have gangs there. That's the that's the uh, part of that uh, that triangle where a lot of the meth and all the stuff comes through there that way. But they wanted to do it around peace. They call their they don't call they call them tattoos, but the, but their the the cultural name is mochas. They call them mochas, and they didn't want to have. Uh, uh, a regular mocha, they want to have the word peace interpreted on there because you do have bloods and you had crips there, and all kinds of different gangs. And so they want to bring, and this is what we want to do with that within a short period of time that we had to create this. It's about eight foot by eight foot or 10 foot by 10 foot image. And it's now at a right across from a library in a, one of those strip malls. This is Tommy E.T well-known cultural activist in New Zealand who met me, he and other Pacific Island met me along with the Polynesian Panthers, took me straight to the Marae and gave me official welcoming to the land in, in their language. These youngsters don't realize today what they're getting into when they go into the system, it's a modern day slavery, profit, what have you prison industrial complex, private property. Hallelujah. This is about justice. In, in, integrating two of my historical images together. This is symbolic of progressive revolutionary activists who are still incarcerated today. You got uh, Amamiya Abu Jamal, you got Lenny Peltier, and you got many, many other brothers and sisters who are incarcerated or out the country at this particular time. Free political prisoners, Freedom Fighters USA, fighters for peace, justice, freedom, particularly the struggle against recognized cruel and oppressive conditions, governments, inhumane policies and actions. This is at the Lorraine Hansberry uh, 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 Museum in Tennessee. The site where Dr. King was assassinated is now a museum. And they have this permanent exhibit there of the movement of the 60s. And they wanted to include this image as one of the permanent images in the museum that I, I we were agreed to let them paint it as a part of the uh, exhibition, permanent exhibition. And last, I wanted to do the more remix of Paper Boy with gender, sister as the saying all power to the people. And that's the end of that part of the presentation. Thank you much. So if that's the 25 minutes, I'll stop and uh, leave my time. That was perfect, I appreciate it. The, I don't know if I can really put this better than the comment section did which the whole time was just inspired by the work that you did and how international these images were when you were communicating and that people could relate to the the power behind it and that connection and that fighting for freedom and kind of community and that was beautiful to see it's very interesting to see that as well as to see for like our next speaker how it is when you grow up in an area where you have to figure out who you are in this and kind of that journey of what art is and kind of expressing that. So our next person speaking, Keone, very excited to have her take the stage here. So, okay. please. Thank you. I'm about to share my screen here. Um, wow, I just wanna first say that Emery, that was, um, that was amazing to, to to see all of that history that you've um, contributed to. And some of those images have been like a permanent imprint on, you know, what I've um, experienced, you know, here in the Los Altos Mountain View um, community. And so my presentation is a little 
um, different, more so about how art had been um, kind of molded my my life as far as like planting seeds, if you may. Um, planting seeds of liberating thoughts, planting seeds of inspiration, planting seeds of revolution. And so just a quick background of myself. Um, I grew up in the Los Altos community, went to um, Santa Rita Elementary School, went to Egan Middle School, went to Los Altos High School. And uh, I tell you, you know, it's it was it was really rough being the only person that looked like me um, in the entire school almost. So, you know, um, there was a lot of inferior um, feelings that 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 came with uh, growing up in that community. But I want to start off with you know, kind of the years of me growing up in the Los Altos um, school district and some of the images that really spoke to what I was feeling, but I didn't really know the words yet. I didn't have the education yet to be able to articulate what it was, but these images spoke directly to what I was feeling. And the first one with you know the the white face and the and you know covering up the black face, um, a lot of us in our community, unfortunately, and in other communities, have to do what is called code switching. Right, we have to go into a room of let's say predominantly white folks, and um, have to automatically switch our attitude, switch the way we look, switch the way even our tone of voice. You know. It, it switches and it causes some severe mental health um, concerns, in my opinion, having to go from place to place and, and switch like that. Uh, but this image right here spoke to me. And I, I think I was maybe in middle school when I first saw this. Um, and, and it spoke to me as to where I have to get up in the morning and I have to make sure that I'm a different person when I get to high school or when I get to middle school. Um, I had teachers, you know, flat out say that I shouldn't have been there. Uh, I don't deserve to be there. Um, asked me why I was there. I had teachers who um, told me that I was supposed to be barefoot and pregnant. I've had teachers um, tell me that, you know, other teachers were talking about me and in plotting to fail me, plotting to um, to try to pin things on me that I never did. Uh, so it was it was a constant battle going to school because I knew that I had um, it, it, I was going to war every single day. I was going to war and it was a it was a mental war, you know. Um, I look at this this other image of Ruby Bridges, you know, having to be ex, ex, um, ha having to be walked to her class, and you have you know the word nigger on the on the on the wall there. And even though there wasn't a lot of that language towards me, it was the the idea you shouldn't be here. I'm black. I'm uh, poor, you know, according to them. Um, and I'm a female. So that's like triple oppression, right? Like, what am I doing here? You know, how did you even get into this school? A lot of teachers would ask me, even, um, what is it, parents, parents would ask me, how did you get in this school? You know, like, what did you do to get into this school? And I was, uh, I was, you know, it was an um, inter-district transfer because my mom grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I'll talk about that later uh, on. But growing up in that, in that household, there was already a preparation for war because my mom already lived through it you know, lived through segregation, lived through um, integration, lived through Black Wall Street. And so my mom was very much 
you got to go to the right schools because that's the best education, but prepare for war. Um, and so I did in a way that oh, what, what a six-year-old could do, right? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm trying to be the best I could possibly be, be the smartest I could possibly be. And having so much pressure on me as a child to, to fulfill the promises and wishes of my family. And, you know, I remembered some of these images, especially the, the who am I, and, you know, the one with the ancestors and the, and the hands and, you know, we're, they're, they're setting the foundation. I felt a lot of pressure about that. Um, and these images kind of gave me some relief when I first saw them, or I'm talking about maybe high school is when I first saw these, um, is that I'm, I'm not stepping forward alone, but I'm stepping forward with, you know what I'm saying? Um, that there is a foundation under me that has that has got me to this point and that um yes it might it might be you know a lot of pressure on someone so young but to know that i've i'm coming from roots from a foundation that has um has elevated me um just you know hearing stories about my great grandfather and 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 what he's done for our family as far as trying to be an entrepreneur and, and, you know, just things that stories that you hear at home, um, these, this, these images kind of brought that back for me, um, knowing that I come from a people who have fought for me to get here. And it took me a little while to to get that, to, to get to that point, because like I said, all throughout, um, middle school and elementary school, you know, I had teachers, I had parents plotting against me to try to get this one little black girl out of their school. And so I'm, I'm coming into my own when I get into high school, especially um, when I had global connections with Miss Bissonette, uh, that kind of taught me a little bit more about me. And so I want to talk a little bit about Black Wall Street. And if, if you don't know about Black Wall Street, it was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, Greenwood, Orchard, and Pine, my mom would always say. And she remembers it like, like yesterday. You know, that's where the movie theaters were. That's where the bank. That was the laundromat, the grocery store, you know. Um, and she was there when it burned down. And so these stories is, is something that I've lived with for a long time. And I never really saw the images until I got to high school and to really know what my mom went through and to really know, okay, this is why she's pushing so hard for me to go to these quote unquote elite schools um, so that I could get the better education and know how to survive. That's basically what she was trying to teach me. You need to know how to survive in this world with people like this because this is what's going to happen in the workplace. This is what's going to happen when you're in the grocery store. You need to know what I know, even though it's not your generation, it's going to look different, but it, the essence is still the same. Now, when I got to high school, I learned about apartheid South Africa. And at that point, I remember Miss Bissonette telling me, it's not just you. And I was just, it, it blew my mind because it was like this big um, art, it was like an art show or something. It was a big display in front of the office. And it had, you know, the Holocaust and then it had Haiti and then it had um, apartheid South Africa. And it was just oppression all over the world. And I had no idea that my isolated or what I thought my isolated situation was global. And that right there changed my life. When I found out about apartheid South Africa and Winnie Mandela and Nelson Mandela and these iconic photos here that we see and we learn about, this is the first time I'm ever seeing anything that could relate 
to how I'm feeling, even though I don't have a gun to my head. I don't have, I'm not running from my life. I feel like mentally I'm, I'm being tortured. And so these images help mold my revolutionary actions later on in life. Um, because I learned that I wasn't alone. My people were not alone in this world going through the same oppression and systematic racism that I'm going through. But these are children that stood up for this. So what is my role, right? Um, I looked, I started diving. I mean, when I say diving into history, I started diving into history my freshman year. Um, or my sophomore year of of high school, and I learned about you know Shirley Chisholm, and I learned about Phyllis Wheatley, and um, I I went and said I was gonna go ahead and do the start at BSU. Started at BSU, was the president there until I graduated. Wanted to make sure that the people on our campus were heard because there was a lot of policing on Los Altos campus of the black males on campus, a lot of policing. And so there was some resistance there. And even though I wasn't being targeted, my friends were being targeted, my friends' boyfriends were being targeted. And so we decided to kind of have like a little forum I remember briefly, I was kind of like the, the liaison between the office, the principal, the vice principal, and the um, security staff, you know, just trying to say, hey, this is what our young folks are saying. This is what you're saying. How are we going to make any difference here? So the opportunity was brought up for Camp Anytown. I think it's, it's something different now. It's called something different now, but um, we were offered to go to Camp Anytown. My, myself went, my mom went, a few of our um, black students went, and the secure, the head of the security at Los Altos High School went. And I tell you, that literally sparked a change in that man that I, I, you know, people say, you know, once you get older, you're just not changing, right? You know, that's how they think they're going to be racist. They're going to be discriminatory. They're going to be prejudiced. When I tell you this man literally broke down and had no, no real understanding of the trauma he was causing. And the trauma that he was um, he was going through, you know, in his own life, you know. So um, images like the ones that I saw motivated me, planted the seed, so that I could do something. What was in my power to do? And so that was one of the things that we did on Los Altos campus. Um, Learn, learning a lot about African women. Um, and, you know, Ida B. Wells, and, and, and she, she used her words in order to um, liberate her folks. And then you have um, Madam C.J. Walker, you know, a businesswoman. And then you have the modern day, you know, Black Panther warriors, you know, who, who, um, a representative of the Dakomi, uh, the Dakomi women in Africa, you know, bringing that imagery is so important, I feel, um, to elevate not only Black people, but Black women. Um, I remember for the first time reading, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sing, and I had no idea who, um, I had no, I had no idea who this woman was, right? And I'm just like, wow. I read that book maybe about three or four times, 
And each time it, it just sung something different to me because I knew that there was a part of my story in it that I could see every single time, every single time. And that's when I started diving into black female poets and black female um, authors and really trying to figure out where is my purpose? Where, where do I go? What do I do? What skills do I have to be able to, um, to move this movement forward? How can I contribute? Because as you see on the other side, there's, you know, this young brother who is, you know, painting gold over his chains. I'm trying to break mine. Break mine, not only, you know, physically, but mentally. I'm not trying to stay in bondage. So as we move forward into, you know, the, the 20th century, or not 20th century, but the, the early 2000s and um, police brutality has become more and more um, publicized. It's just, you know, it's been a part of our community um, for some, because even 400 years, but people are now, starting to see or maybe not no can no longer be blind right um and so these images that are recent um help me to motivate my students because i'm i'm a um, former educator and you know i have a lot of my students on my instagram and so i make sure that i can speak to them in a way that they understand. And art is a huge part of that. Her art is a huge part of that because, you know, a lot of my students are white students and they come to me asking, you know, is this true? Did you go through this? I didn't know that this was happening. Miss Keone, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And every time they ask me, I tell them, you need to open a book. You need to learn for yourself. You Not because someone's giving you an assignment. Go look at all of the information, not just the information that's given to you. And then what you do with that information, what you do with that truth is how you change your generation and your generation and your generation after that. What are you gonna do with that truth? What I did with my truth is I, like I said, I dived in. I dived in to all the way back to Yaa Santiwa. I was like, who are these amazing women? And if you don't know anything about Yaa Santiwa, she was like the, she fought the last major war that was led by an African woman. And she led the Ashanti rebellion against the British. And until she was exiled and she later died. But um, this woman was hardcore. And it, it, I mean, she was a hardcore. And, you know, there's a lot of fear that is installed once you start to speak out or speak your truth. And learning about this woman and seeing this woman's image for the first time let me know that fear isn't real. Fear isn't real because the people that came before me couldn't see fear. They can only see progress. And that's how I choose to see and, and, and live my life as progress and not fear. I had the opportunity to go to Ghana in 2019 and I was able to see a live a uh, sculpture um, artist out there. And they were paying tribute to the trans-American, excuse me, the transatlantic slave trade. And all of these images that you see are actual people's images. Um, people who have posed for these images and when I tell you it's such a powerful um, vision to see when you see it in its totality, 
um, of what happened on the continent. Um, and not even on the continent, but also in different areas of the world. And, um, but what our people had to go through as far as suffering. Um, and then also who wasn't gonna go down without a fight. And that's what some of these images show me is that um, you might have us in bondage, but you can't have us. Lastly, I wanna share with you some of my own personal art that I, um, that I have around me I'm here, uh, Asada Shakur and Malcolm X. Both of these paintings were painted by a homeless man in Oakland. Um, just did amazing, amazing work. Um, the portrait of um, uh, Bob Marley was hand, hand painted. I got that also in Oakland. Uh, to the left of that is a collage that my uncle made for me in prison. In 1992, I was second grade. Um, he made, I didn't know how important this was until much later on in life, but he made this collage for me um, so, that he, so that he could teach me who I was. Um, in some of these paintings, like the uh, the one with the blue outline and the, the, the pyramids are all done by a local artist from that I graduated with at San Jose State. Um, his name is Akeem Rahim. You can find him on um, Instagram and he has art all over uh, the Bay Area. And then lastly, I have um, uh, Isajifo, um, Kwame Nkrumah, who was the first um, president of independent Ghana. Lastly, there's some more of my art that I have in my room. Um, the one that is really special to me is the young lady who um, has like a the cloth over her shoulder. This was painted for me by a student or a client of mine when I was working at um, Unity Care for the county. And this is a young white girl who, um, who painted this and she's like, I, I see the essence and I wanna paint it. And this is, and, and this is kind of how art flows through culture as well, because you can see something, not be able to articulate it with words, but you can do it in, in an art form. And I think that that's, like I said, it's so important to be able to speak different languages through art so that you can connect people like Emery was talking about, all of those people who were connected through art and could feel the struggle. Um, and so I think that, I don't know, I have one more. Um, in college, <laughs> when I was teaching still, I would take these images to my classroom and put them up all over my classroom. Now this is a private white school, okay? So, you know, people were like, oh, like they <laughs> couldn't really, you know, what are they gonna say? But um, I wanted, you know, those few people of color to be able to see themselves outside of, you know, a, a textbook. And so a lot of these images I also purchased from, from, um, from Oakland at the Berkeley Flea Market, actually and um, had these up as inspirational um, portraits for, for folks to actually start looking and seeing um, and researching on their own. And so that concludes my uh, presentation. I hope I didn't go too long, but thank you for having me again and I appreciate it. Yeah, that, that was incredible. Uh, every time that one person speaks up and shares their story, there's so many more that can relate to that story and that have been through their own struggles. And 
your story was very inspirational and I appreciate you sharing that with us tonight. Uh, a quick like housekeeping. Um, Thank you. Of course. The last two people who will be speaking tonight are myself and Kiyoshi. We'll just be giving you guys similar stuff about ourselves and how our connections are through art. Um, after that, which depending on how long Kiyoshi and I take, shouldn't be too long, around 8.20, 8.25, we'll go into questions. So if you have questions you want to ask, go ahead and type those out into the chat. Think of those. Um, it'll kind of just be like a free for all. I'll just kind of ask the question that people um, put in the, the comments and whoever is to can answer that. Let me pull up mine now. Cool. Good morning. My name is Keenan Mose, AKA King K, AKA AKA King K to plug. So let me tell you kind of about my identity and how I express that through art. So a little bit about me. I was born at El Camino Hospital in Mountain View and grew up in Los Altos as one of about 130-ish black people. I was a dedicated soccer player and played for MVLA, then De Anza, and I finished off playing through uh, Juventus Academy. Some of the greatest memories I have and experiences come from soccer, because outside of my soccer teams, I was often the only brown or black kid. So when in school and most other life situations, I would stick out. And there's this kind of funny limbo that I was in as a mixed kid. So my dad's side is white Jewish, and my mom's side is black Christian. I was definitely never treated as white, but I was never fully accepted as black. People would refer to me different depending on the situation. Slavery, I was black. Sports, black. Rules and laws, black. But in terms of personality and confronting people, white. I spoke properly. I would, you know, I'm from Los Altos and I'm Jewish, which first off, that's completely separate from being black or white. I don't even want to get into that tonight, but my insecurity of my identity was a result of this disconnect between the positive incredible stories I would hear about myself from my parents at home and how the school would teach me about me and how the world saw me. So the way I think of how I was taught about my identity outside of home, I break into three words, run, shoot, steal. So this applies to my life as an athlete and how one of the main visual representations of black people you see on TV is athletics, run quick, shoot well, steal well. This is also how they portray us on the news, running from the police, shootings, stealing. And even how school taught us about black people, running is in like the underground railroad and running from like slave masters, being shot and beaten and stolen from our land. As a mixed kid, there weren't many opportunities for me to see mainstream media or pop culture of people that look like me. Again, I wasn't white, and I definitely also wasn't accepted as black, like as full black. So the most significant re uh, representation that I saw that stuck with me was Fresh Prince. Man, I love Fresh Prince. It's just the energy that he would carry when he'd be on, like, on the TV show, it made me happy. He would make other people happy. And he looked like me, so I wanted to embody that. It wasn't just through TV that I grew these connections to art. It was also through music. My girlfriend and I actually had this joke that she has still not been able to show me a single song that I haven't heard before, in English at least. I might not be great at it, but I got rhythm and I like to move. And I love the power that a story can tell. And the stories that are, are told through music can evoke such emotion in a unique way because in a song or a music video, the audience had to listen. So for someone that grew up feeling like I didn't really have that voice, music was a way to connect to other stories of people who either were telling beautiful things about black people or just talking about black people in general. And that kind of brings me to representation. So meaningful representation is something that's really important to me. And that's influenced who I am now and what I do now. So I'm a senior at the University of Oregon and I study journalism, advertisement. And a big thing that I focus on is representation. The journey of like finding confidence in my own identity. That's what made me switch my major. So I wanted to have the opportunity to speak my truth and share what I felt. And something that I, see, I rarely see on TV, which is black is beautiful. So this June, I actually got the chance to do that. Just as Vanguard hosted an event that was black is beautiful. It's an education event featuring beautiful handmade art pieces, education on big topic questions, Engage with the community to have open conversation for children and adults alike 
to learn and participate. So in these photos, you can kind of see some of the stuff that was done. So like this black is beautiful is how it looked in the park. And then in the bottom, you can kind of see how my backyard was just transformed into this eight by four boards everywhere for like a week. You, we couldn't even get the paint off the ground. I think it's just permanently done now. I want to shout out some of these artists though, like Natalie, Erna, Brianna, who put together a lot of this artwork that was displayed there. And just take a look, like a second and just look at these. And like a little self plug, the one with the the black shadow, I got really tired at the end of the day, lay down and then the, they trace me and that's like the dude standing with his um the fist up. But either way, this event was really powerful because it was to have that conversation and be able to see, okay, black is beautiful. Here is different situations where it is. Here, let's let's open a conversation about that. This year also allowed me to get deeper into exploring my own story. So allow me to be clear with my experience and try to educate and create awareness around it. So I released a few songs and a music video and artwork to tell my story. So this is kind of what I did. I took a picture of my history textbook from high school and that's what you see in the background there and like the only page that talked about black people is with the slavery and so i put that and then kind of all these words that stuck out to me as things i've heard things i feel about myself or things that i've seen about myself or black people and kind of put that together so it matters is the first song on there and it has to do with like the meaning of words so growing up i was adamant words don't hurt me like, I, I'm too strong to let them bring me down. It's just not going to work. And it wasn't partway until I was in college that I realized the impact of not seeing or hearing about myself in a positive light. It was very damaging to who I was, and it made me feel confined to this stereotype of a black man. And I was thinking back, and it made me think about track season my junior year of high school. It was block schedule, and because of my free periods, I was out early, like by lunchtime. So I get out of class, drive to Hayward, I get my hair braided, haircut, I look fresh. So I come back just in time for practice. So I'm rocking my running shoes, basketball shorts, white tank top tee, and a do-rag. I'm telling you, I looked fly. So I hop in the line for warm-ups, and this one girl stops and looks at me and goes, wow, it looks like you just got out of jail. Were you in jail? So I, ha I had to have a little fun. I'm like, yes. But in truth, I'd had calc class with her earlier. Like, why would you even say that? But it didn't fully register then. And then I thought of another time with this group of girls I started kicking it with. And they're like, do you know that when we met you, we were scared of you? Why, why would you be scared of me? Um, you know, because, um, oh, because I'm sexy? N no, because you're black. I'm like, oh, okay. So this photo here is something that I keep thinking back on. This is a march. There's Kyoshi on the left, myself on the center, and then one of our friends all the way on the right there, Chris. And this was a march that we shut down the Dunbar and we marched on Facebook and was one of the first marches that I got to meet people and hear people from other cities around me that had similar experiences. And when I would hear them speak, I felt so empowered by their experience and their power to be able to do that. And as someone who was just still, I mean, I'm still working on finding my voice. I, I'm speaking up, I'm doing these marches, but I'm still someone who's trying to figure out where I stand, how I can use my voice to do better. And that's why tonight was so mind blowing for me as well. Like being able to have Emery Douglas come and enlighten us on all he does. And then followed by Keone coming in. Sibwa is the word I was saying I was going to use before. I use it with my mom and sister. Strong, independent, black woman. I love that individuality. I love that kind of being able to communicate messages across different ways through art. And I'm so excited for the next things that we have coming up. So without, without any further ado. I want to introduce you to the person that is causing all my gray hairs, and that is Kiyoshi. He doesn't know that f this photo is there, but you're welcome. You're welcome for that. <laughs> all right. Yo, first of all, once again, I just want to pause everything, and I want to give a moment to give it up for Keone and Emery, who gave up their time tonight to uh, help educate and speak with us. And I can't believe you use that. I was gonna thank you, Keenan, but then you use that, uh, that image of me. So, you know, uh, you, got, you got something coming in our next event. Just, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna let that be known. 
Another person I really dearly want to thank from the bottom of my heart is Seth Donnelly. Uh, without you, Justice Vanguard wouldn't have happened and tonight wouldn't have happened. So just so everybody knows, Seth Donnelly, the, um, he's a founder of Justice Vanguard. We wouldn't be here without him. So thank you, Seth Donnelly. All right, now let's get into my presentation, then we'll open it up. So my name is Kiyoshi Taylor. I'm the co-founder with uh, Seth and uh, Keenan for Justice Vanguard. And I'm so happy to be here with you guys tonight. I'm not a monster, I'm a Buckeye. I was born in Ohio State Hospital. Um, I love Cleveland. And as you can see, that's my family there. Uh, when I was much cuter, uh, not much cute, I'm still pretty cute, but much younger. And I, my whole point of Justice Vanguard and this presentation is to show that I am just like everybody else. You shouldn't have to be afraid of me. Uh, I'm human, I make mistakes, but I also have love just like everybody else. In West California, born and raised, like Keenan said, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was the first TV show that I ever thought I related to. Look at fifth grade when I had them buck teeth and a flat top just like Will Smith. I wanted to be Will Smith because I could relate to him. And then fast, and just like Will Smith, my relationship with my uh, late father, Ken Taylor, he was, man, Keenan, turn your mic off. <laughs> um, but just like Phil Banks in the show, uh, Fresh Prince, my dad was literally Uncle Phil. And anyone you meet who knows him will tell you he was just like Uncle Phil. Our relationship was just like Will and Uncle Phil. And just like Uncle Phil, he was a big teddy bear. He was a philosopher at Stanford. And from Ohio, he came from nothing and made something out of himself, which as a black male, everyone should aspire to. And as a philosopher, he taught me to question everything, question my surroundings, question why things happen. And that gave me a curious mind. And I never just accepted this is the way it is. I also grew up and the black church had a big influence in my life, even though I may not always go to church. <laughs> uh, it had a big influence on what I do, uh, how I perceive things, and especially it had a big influence on music and what I listen to. Uh, my whole family is big on gospel. We listen to a whole lot of music and I know all, all the great soul songs, the R&B songs, and by these amazing black art artists like Marvin Gaye, and they inspired me every day. And not only that, but as I branched out and I got into hip hop, like people like Tupac and Nas, they, they really started to teach me. And I thought to myself, this is music. This is what it's about. And then when I really started to listen to the lyrics, I realized, and I had, I had, a, I had this epiphany of, why is it that in these songs by these amazing artists like Nas and Tupac and Joey Badass, and I hope you guys are reading these lyrics right now. Why is it in these lyrics, I learned more about my history, my ancestors past than I ever learned in a high school classroom from any textbook. I learned more in a three minute song than four years of high school. And as I look more into it, I realize we aren't just in hip hop, we're in everything. Rage Against the Machine, Going Against the Police, Killing in the Name of, and one of the biggest albums for me was Jay-Z, one of my favorite hip hop artists, teaming up with Linkin Park. Cause then I realized, oh, I don't just relate to what black people sing about. I also relate to what this multi-ethnicity group sings about. And Mike Shinoda, the Asian Amer American in me really relates to some of the songs he has written. And he's one of the greatest MCs out there. I also love comedy and comedy and philosophy are intertwined because let's be real, comedians are just philosophers with a punchline. And artists like Chris Rock, Steve Harvey, 
Cat Williams with his terrible hair and Dave Chappelle. They have a they have a gift of kind of breaking down uh, the black experience and really helping us uh, examine it in a way that isn't always so heavy. I really do think that black laughter is black healing because when black people laugh, it's more than just, oh, ha ha, he made a joke. No, it's, it's, make, it's, it's levity. It's these, we carry this weight on our shoulders. And when we laugh, it's like, we're letting it all go. Like, I don't know if you've noticed when black people laugh, we laugh because we have a lot on our shoulders and we're just letting it go. It feels good. And it, laughter is a part of life. In 2015, that's when I really started to wake up to my surroundings, what it means to be black in America. I already knew since I had a curious mind, I realized I wasn't treated like everyone else. But when Trayvon Martin was shot, I realized I could have been me. And I really looked around and I see all these other people getting shot people who looked like me and they were getting no justice. I was mad, I was furious. And that's when I teamed up with the aforementioned Seth Donnelly and we created Yaj, Youth Alliance for Justice. That was really the founding of what, that was a seed that grew into the beautiful tree that is Justice Vanguard. We led a march in 2015 and at the time before, Keenan came along, that was the biggest march in, La in Los Altos Mountain View for Black Lives Matter. We got about 400 kids to take to the streets uh, in honor of Tamir Rice and Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, uh, Crawford, and the list just goes on and on. And I made forever connections from them. And as you can see there, I know they're listening right now. The Raging Grannies were there. <laughs> So shout out to the Raging Grannies, you all some lifelong friends. And so 2020 happened, sorry. So 2020 happened. And I realized it's the same thing that I was saying in 2015. It's the same thing happening. We called for justice, we called for change. Yet here we are reliving the same, the same instances, the same traumas that we've been calling them out since 2015, since the 90s, 80s, 60s, slavery. It just goes on and on and on. And I realized we're stuck in this stupid cycle of there's a killing and then people get mad and we protest. And then after the protest, we go home, we get comfortable and then it just repeats itself. And then there's a killing and then there's a protest and then we, we repeat, it's a cycle that we're stuck in. And, and as you can see, here's the timeline of what happened uh, in my experience. The protests in 2015, say, seeing Trayvon Martin and me, we created Yaj, um, we educated the public and planted some seeds for the future, the 2020 civil unrest, but unlike the cycle that we've been stuck in, Justice Vanguard is taking a final stand to end this, to end this cycle. Like I said, you got to plant the seed to watch a beautiful tree grow. Yaj planted that seed for us. And in 2020, when we brought our groups together, I realized this is all from the efforts from all the previous, not just 2015, but from all the previous generations, like Keone, like Emery, all these people made it possible for us to all be here today discussing these image or discussing what these images mean to us, discussing change um, and, and our history and how we can move forward. I really have found my voice. I've found, I found my passion in a way. I have plenty of other passions, but making sure the future is brighter for kids who look like me is definitely one of my passions. And I found my voice and it's standing up for people who've been stepped on and oppressed for all these years. And I really think education is key. In order to fix all these issues that we have, we have to learn about the past 
then you have to relate it to the present. And then you have to look to the future. Because you, a lot of people, you know, they're like, oh, we need all this change. We need, but what they don't understand is how we got here, how we got in these situations, how we got to these instances. You have to learn about the past to fully understand the present, and then we can build a better future. I may, I've made a lot of art and that fist is gonna be a shirt that you guys can get. Uh, all donations will go to Justice Vanguard. Um, just to bring out some of uh, the, basically kind of showing black is beautiful and it's not something to be afraid of. Of course, I dabble in other things just like everybody else. It's not all doom and gloom with me. My mission is to educate the public to rally behind change and build a better future for our youth. But right now, we stuck right here. So it's up to us to really educate ourselves so we can make the necessary changes to build a better future for our youth. Otherwise, I'm gonna be here in five years again, speaking on the same stuff that I was discussing five years ago, that I was discussing today. And I don't want that. And I know my little nephews and cousins, they deserve better. So let's make a difference. This is a soundtrack to our future, you guys. Are you in? If so, join us. We're Justice Vanguard. One of the big goals, and Keenan, please jump back on right now. Uh, right now, we want to kind of just tell you guys a little bit about Justice Vanguard and what we are building to build a better future. We need ethnic studies so badly as a ninth grade requirement for every incoming freshman to be the foundation of their history going forward. Whatever history class they take from that point on, every student needs to be in the same ethnic studies class. The reason, we need to learn about everybody's history. That will grow a respect in our community to understand the struggles between white and black, Mexican and Asian, uh, Latino and just everybody. Because right now I can tell you, growing up in Los Altos, there is a major lack of respect, empathy and understanding for one another and for your neighbor. We need to get to know each other a much, a, a lot better. And one of the things, <laughs> one of the things- Real quick, real quick, yeah. that having ethnic studies doesn't only teach you how to know other people better, but it also helps to reinforce who you are. Yes. There's so many people that, especially if you're mixed, especially if you're some kind of brown or black, you're not hearing good things about yourself. So it's important that we're teaching good history to them so that you can love yourself and learn to appreciate and love others. Completely, completely. You know, and not only that, but it'll help connect the past to the present. Some of the things you'll be discussing in these uh, classrooms will be, well, this happened in 1960s and look how it relates to today. Because a lot of the problems we're having right now, and it creates healthy dialogues, unlike going on Twitter and Facebook and just seeing all the hate, no. It's different when you're face to face having these conversations. And one of the biggest issues America has had is we teach our kids basically lies. We're like, oh, this was the civil rights movement in the 1960s and everything's okay today, but we didn't fix anything. So we need to actually talk about the necessary changes, what we actually did to get to where we are today. And you'll realize, Maybe we haven't come as far as, as you think. So if you're, about this, um, if you're about this fight, please stay in touch with us. Go to the Justice Vanguard, ah, justicevanguard.org. Go to contact us. Give us your name, email. Tell us what you're interested in. Tell us how you may want to help. Or just say hello, because we're very friendly. After about 10 a.m., we're very friendly. I see how you got me back. Go back real quick. I saw how you threw that in there. What? Look at that bottom uh, part. What? Kenya Moose. I can't spell. Is that? Because everyone spells my name wrong. Okay, what? go ahead. Is that not how you spell your name? Oh, I don't know. You put a dragon picture of me. I don't know. 
So please join our fight for education and above, uh, and we're also doing more things than just ethnic studies for education. So Keenan, please, or Kenya, whatever, however you spell your name, please fill them in on that. Cool. For education, there's a few levels that we've looked at. We've done education towards our general communities with like the Black is Beautiful event, our Juneteenth events. We're doing ethnic studies and trying to get that implemented, as Kiyoshi was just talking about. But there's another big area that needs to kind of catch up and has a lot to do, and that is like organizations such as like sports clubs all the way through companies who right now are trying to figure out what what education do we need? How do we take that next step to be anti-racist? And we're putting together a webinar and kind of just action plan for an assessing with companies and figuring out how we can implement that education. How can we learn where you are now and figure out how to get to those next steps? Because it's going to take all of us doing this together to be able to make those changes. So go on our website. You can go and check that all out. Um, in order for us to keep movements like this going, again, we're grassroots organizations. I'm, I'm a college student. Um, that also means broke. Um, so the money that comes in for us to be able to do these things is through those donations. And so far, sadly, it's cut off in the screenshot, but we have raised, I think it's like 38 or 39,000 masks, which we've been working with uh, other organizations to give out to those in need. We've been getting sanitizer donations, sleeping bags, jackets, shoes, and different ways to help take care of people. There's a lot of lack of humanity that goes on in terms of how the government takes care of people, and it's time for us to step up to do that. So there's different ways you can get involved. If you can pledge, like there's four tiers here, you can put, you know, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, 50, whatever it is a month to say, hey, like, I'm just going to consistently do this. Here's, here's a way that I can consistently help. If you don't have that option and you want to get involved and, you know, use your body for it, use your mind for it, contact us, get in touch and let's start working on things because just us doing this so the more people we have who are trying to help and passionate about this and they're trying to get educated the more change that we can make there really is no us without you so please uh oh and i also got a side note um there is going to be a uh haiti uh, uh demonstration protest uh march 1st in uh, San Jose by the public library, 100 Larkin Street, uh, 4 to 5.30. Uh, there will be speakers, including me and Keenan. Uh, and it's just to stand up to the um, unfair treatment by the Haitian uh, dictator regime, basically. And also uh, to stand up against the deportations of the U.S. to people uh, of people of Haitian descent back to Haiti, who have every right to be here literally legally so if, for more in information go to haiti solidarity.net awesome. and so oh, you have more let's open it up no cool. let's open it up for questions cool so i uh, just opened the chat up for people to ask questions um i got one earlier so something that we had talked about and this one's kind of towards emory but anyone can kind of follow it up after was there's a lot about representation and how black people are shown in media, on TV, and stuff like that. So the question was, I just saw Judas in The Black Messiah recently. Mr. Douglas, um, have you had a chance to watch the film yourself? And if you have, did you think that there was an accurate representation of the party? Muted. You're muted right now. I, I have uh, seen it once, but I... I, I um... I don't have HBO, so they had sent it to me to see it for a limited time. Um, it's, it, it, you know, Hollywood films are Hollywood films. And you, you can't tell the story of, of, the, uh, of a movement in an hour and a half. So, and then you have the, you have the uh, films that have to go in front of a board to be approved. What's going to go in and what can't go in? So you got all those kind of limitations. Even though young creative directors and what have you may have been wanting to do more, but there's limitations to that. You see, so I, I, I'll come speak to it in, in, in that context. You know, I'm not here to discourage the young people from continuing not to continue. But it's it's still when we well, like Huey Newton used to say, power is the ability 
to define phenomena and make it act in a desired manner. And I don't, I don't think that has, that has come to reality yet. That process is ongoing. You still got those who control uh, the editing and other aspects of how they feel it should be viewed, maybe as opposed to what was presented to them in, in this whole context. Content. Emory, I got a question. I got a question for you. Um, what literature or art or um, movies would you recommend to people uh, that you think would be helpful to educate them on? Well, on if you want to it on, on, the, uh, on Fred Hampton, you look at the murder of Fred Hampton. That, that's, that's, a, that's the documentary. It throws out the whole dynamics of what took place. Hear that, people? <laughs> it's online on YouTube and you, you other places, you know. That kind of connects to what someone was asking you, Keone, was with so much information and books being out there, where do you start? Like, what is a book that you'd recommend someone start with in terms of getting education if they like to read? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, we'll say for folks who are, you know, 18 and up, <laughs> I would say there's a, a really good book. Um, and excuse my French, but it's called um, From Niggas to Gods. Uh, it's, it's a volume one and volume two. It, it kind of helps speak in a different language to folks. So, you know, depending on, um, you know, if you're just starting out, you know, um, you, you know, maybe you saw, let's say for, for example, someone saw Chirac regardless of how we feel about the film, right? Um, it sparked something for someone to look into something, right? And sometimes books can be very intimidating to people. Uh, it doesn't speak a language that they understand. And so that's one version or one way to go about it. Um, another book for me that was uh, motivational was the, our groundbreaking really was the um the oh gosh what was it called it was a book by elaine brown um oh my god i'm blanking out on the title yes yes thank you um elaine brown that was a that was an incredible book also the autobiography of asada asada shakur called asada that was a great book i read that multiple times um, also there's a book called medical apartheid. You know, if you, if you want to branch out and really see how intricate, or, uh, excuse me, how, um, um, precise this system has been in destroying black lives and black bodies through science, um, medical apartheid is something that I would recommend I'm looking back at my, um, there's also a book called um, Science of Self. That's a really good book. Um, just, it talks about the science and ancient science of African people and African Americans and kind of how we display that today, even though we might not know what it is. Um, there's a book for women called Sacred Woman. That's a really powerful book um, by Karina Fua. Um, what else? Oh, um, if you just look up the author, Anthony Browder, I had the opportunity of meeting him in person, had the opportunity of, um, of being able to go to a few of his lectures, you know, his book series, um, the Now Valley Contributions to Civilization, that's one of his books. Um, he has like a survival guide for black people. It, I forget the exact name of it, but Anthony Browder, is another really phenomenal author. Can you do me and so is his daughter. Could you make hmm? us a list? Like, could we, we could put a list? Like, yeah. there's so many good books you just said. I want to read that one. I want to read this one. So yeah, you yeah. You know what? I'll, I can I'll type see. you up a list for sure. Um, I have all of these books in my library, so I can definitely um, let me make a note to myself. Yeah. And I'll, I want. I'll I'm gonna throw in a book too. It's called Black Indians. Uh, it's about. Uh, oh, I have that one. Wait. 
it, it, it's right. It's amazing. It's mm -hmm. about runaway slaves who uh, fled to Native American villages and how they found ex acceptance in those villages. Um, it's a fascinating read, mm -hmm. especially about just the untold history of America and the original people. Right. Okay, we got right. three more questions. Let's see if I can mind these two. So we got for Emery right here. Hello, Emery. Thank you for being here in this evening. I noticed that a lot of your art centers around black people, their joy and their pain. How much do you use satire in your art? Because it seemed a little bit less frequent, like the Donald Trump photos that you had. What is the role of satire that you use or do you like to use it? I'm sorry, I can hear you. I heard, heard you. Do you like to use satire in your work? Because of the pieces you showed tonight, a lot of them were centered around black people and strength and unity. And you had a few around satire. So what is your use with satire in? Well, I, I think if it, it's just, if it's relative, it's relative in the art itself. It just comes out in, in what I'm trying to convey. You know, it's not necessary that uh, I'm trying to uh, make all art be of a serious nature. It can have a, a humor to it and still be serious. In that in that context, so uh, you know I, I, that's what the, the historical artwork with the pig drawing. Those, that was satire in, in in many ways. It was humorous, but it was very pointed and had a very sharp edge to it in many ways. So you can you can you can you can. It's just uh, working out the art for yourself or how you can merge that together. And not lose the uh, lose the seriousness of it, or the or the fun of it, or you know all those things. It's a balance of how you have to work at to to come to that point. That's a good answer. Put it well. Yeah. So this one is a question to me, but I think Kiyoshi might be able to speak to it as well. Those as Keenan, you mentioned not being able to identify with one group or the other. As someone who was in a similar boat, how do you find your own identity and significance? So I'll, I'll take this one first and then I'll pass it to Kiyoshi. I think that my like journey to finding who I was was very difficult because they were such drastic opposites, like the white Jewish versus like black Christian. It's like on every front, there was just like a very different thing that would happen. And at some point I realized that I was dictating who I was based on how other people told me who I was rather than who I just was. And as soon as I got to that point of like, all right, I like this thing. I don't like this thing. I'm just going to be me. That's when I started feeling a lot more comfortable with it. Then I felt more open to learning about the different parts of who I was. Because for a long time, being Jewish took away from being black. Because if I was black, I couldn't be Jewish. So I had to learn about that and learn about like the millions of Ethiopian black Jews. And through education like that for myself, I was able to kind of accept who I was and be proud of like, damn, like I come from a history of people who've been through a lot of shit but are still going strong today. How about you, Kiyoshi? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's similar to what you have to say. Um, it's once I learned more about my past, my history, my family's history, and realized how strong it was, it made me feel strong. I know I didn't have any more self-doubt. And this is just some advice for everybody out there. Be a hundred, if you give a hundred percent of yourself, it don't matter what other people think. So just be 100% you, give 100% of yourself, and if they can't accept it, that that's their problem. Can you chime in on that one too, please? Go for please. it, please. Um, because even though, you know, I'm not what people would think of as, you know, mixed race or biracial, um, there are, it's a huge indigenous part of my of my family. And, um, you know, because they can't be seen, you know, in my genetics, you know, people, you know, just see black woman, right? Um, but even in the black community within my own family, you know, and this kind of touched to what you were saying, Keenan, um, being separated because I went to the white school, being separated and being treated differently amongst cousins or, you know, family members, because, you know, I talk white, well, you know, and that's a whole nother subject we can talk about is both talking white versus talking black. What is that? Right. Um, but finding like, like the both of you were, were, were talking about is finding your own truth in that, because I, for me, it was, 
education is being black. Being articulate is being black. You know, Africans founded universities, okay? Um, we founded science. So being smart and being articulate and being able to be and stand firmly in that is being black. So I had Woo. to, I had to learn that, you know, on my own. And that's why it's so important to dive deep and let that spiritual, um, and that, that DNA speak to you because it is, it's speaking to you. It's just, are you listening? You know what I'm saying? Because I really had to dig deep into the science of it Be, from, for me, because that's how it spoke to me. Like, okay, how, how do I see this picture? And I feel like internally, this was me 400 years ago. Why do I feel like that? How does that, how did that connect? How do, how do those things connect? And, and learning about it, Dr. Joy DeGruy, another great book, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome, uh, got to meet her, wonderful woman, um, talking about the trauma in which DNA carries. And you don't even know that you're carrying that trauma with you. Um, and being, and diving, diving into that, the, the good and the bad, you know? Um, and so, I, like I said, I, I know this person is talking about, you know, like mixed race, but when I had students who would come to me with the same, you know, white um, Irish mother and, you know, uh, a black father from Kentucky, you know, it's like, well, what, who am I? What do I, you know what I'm saying? Like people look at me in the world as a black woman. How do I identify? Or people look at me as, you know, a black woman, but, but my, you know, my, my mom's Filipino and my dad is black, you know, and, and really finding their truth in their, in their DNA, because that's who you are. And knowing that that mix was a mix a whole long time ago, <laughs> a long time ago before you got here, that was a mix already, <laughs> you know, um, and being and standing in that truth and standing for justice in that truth because that's that's what you do with it. But definitely. Yeah. Definitely. That was really well put. Damn. <laughs> yeah, you have me fuck you have me fist pumping over your mind. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Man, so I think we we're gonna do one more question, which is for Emery. Uh and then if you know we'll, we'll close it off. I wanna get that. Sam's in there too. I gotta I gotta I want to open uh, that one up. I was actually going to say for, it. so there's two questions, one from Seth and one from Sam. I was going to say to Sam's, which was asking about TV shows and movies. We can't list one or two, but I would say that we're going to put a list now because people are asking about the books. Let's put a list on the website of books, movies, and stuff like that. Um, but the last question for... Yeah, well, hold on, just on uh, that one point. He said, he specifically said, oh, as a disservice. Uh, mm. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, for me, a, what a show that would be a disservice would be like a, a kind of a toned down version of black culture, which would be like Blackish or all those ABC shows, all that stuff. Those mm -hmm. th those are all trash. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you want real black culture, you know, watch, watch stuff like the Chappelle Show, uh, some of the ninety, a lot of nineties black TV was amazing and it, it dealt with real issues. Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is amazing. That's why the two of us uh, mm -hmm. referenced it. Uh, and if y'all know anything that you're like, oh, that was terrible, uh, please. <laughs> oh, um, adding to the terrible list then, all white savior complex movies. All Thank you. Where it's like, oh, look, they're racist. Oh no, now they saved, nah, all those are terrible, like trash. Yeah, every oh, Marvel movie has a black sidekick. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I remember in Black Panther, the white dude had to be the savior at the end. <laughs> Don't let's not forget that. <laughs> well, so off of that, uh, Emery, from your experiences that you've had being a Black Panther, what advice do you have for, I guess, myself and Kiyoshi, but also to other people who are young and really not if you're young, other people who are coming up and trying to incite these changes? What advice do you have for us? Well, you have to be uh, you have to be informed, uh, and you have to have the uh, you have to be able to implement 
what you practice, what you speak, mm -hmm. what you think. Uh, you can have the theory and be a great theoretician, but it's, it's theory and the practice. And then okay. I think you can learn from the experience, the limitations, mm -hmm. and and grow from those whatever it is that you obstacles that you may be confronted with have to overcome, and and the challenges you will be confronted with. So it's the theory and the practice integrated together, and being having a, at least a basic knowledge of what it is that you committed to. And you have to be committed to it. It may be a lot of sacrificing, maybe yeah. on job training, something that you have to grow with. Right. I appreciate that. Hundred uh, percent. It's a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys, we're coming up on nine o'clock. Uh, I think it's, this is a good place to wrap it up. Uh, I want to just, from the bottom of my heart, thank you, Emery. Thank you, Keone. Thank you, Kenya. Sorry, Keenan. <laughs> uh, we are Justice Vanguard. This has been conversations with your friendly neighborhood black guys. And just to just to outdo him real quick, I want to leave you guys with a quote. This really smart person said this uh, in an interview in June. There's nothing wrong with not knowing, only with not being willing to learn. That's a quote that I said. Ah, you. <laughs> why are you said someone smart said it? <laughs> Thank you, you guys so funny. much. This Check out our channel. Fun. We'll have plenty more conversations, more webinars, more things like this. Thank you guys so much for attending. Hey. Thank you. Peace and, peace Thank you for having us. Okay. <laughs> okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye.